So this morning we're going to turn to Luke 8, 31 to 43. Luke 8, 31 to 43. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. And the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered that the man be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and Jesus fo- and followed Jesus praising God. And when all the people saw it, they also praised God. Friends, please keep Luke 18 open before you. And let's pray once again. Father, we ask you to open the eyes of our hearts that we might see your son more clearly and trust in him more deeply. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Uh, In my early 20s, I uh, worked for a number of years very closely with a a man who had been blind since about the age of one. He'd had a tumour behind his eyes, and the only way they could deal with the tumour was by taking his eyes, and so he had lived all of his life pretty much completely blind. And that experience of working with him gave me a very uh, important insight into the way that vision impairment affects, affects almost every aspect of a person's life. And I was looking at one recent medical article on this very subject just the other day, and you'll see on the screen a little summary that says vision loss affects more than one's ability to see the world clearly. Individuals with vision impairment are more likely to experience restrictions in their independence, mobility, and educational achievement, as well as an increased risk of falls, fractures, injuries, poor mental health, cognitive deficits, and social isolation. Vision loss also amplifies the effects of other chronic conditions and is a chronic condition itself. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. Now, as debilitating as that condition is, as physical blindness can be, there is, in fact, no condition more dangerous than a related one, but a different one, that of spiritual blindness. That inability to see spiritual reality, to comprehend spiritual truth. For this is a condition that has the potential not only to cripple your life in the here and now, but if left untreated, if allowed to develop, will ruin your life for eternity. Now, why do I mention these things this afternoon? Well, it's because the verses we've just heard from Luke 18 uh, show us examples of both kinds of blindness the physical and the spiritual. But even more importantly than that, and I'm sure you saw it yourself, they highlight life-changing truths for us about the one who has the cure to both kinds of blindness, the one who can remedy both conditions, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so for that reason, I've, at least in my mind and in my sermon notes, given two headings to the two paragraphs in our passage Headings that not so much, uh, again, highlight what we learn about blindness here, as important as that is, but what we learn about the greatness of the great physician, the healer of blindness, the son of man and the son of David. So let's look firstly at the future of the son of man in verses 31 to 34. 
before. And the word future here is very important because Jesus, as we'll see, is making a prediction about himself, about his future. Verse 31, he took the 12 aside and told them, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. That's a little bit strange that the NIV translators have decided to title these verses, Jesus predicts his death a third time. For this, in fact, is at least the fourth time, if not the fifth time, and arguably the sixth time that Luke records Jesus predicting his death. So, you know, maybe translation's their strong point, but not mass. But anyway, but <laughs> leaving that to one side, it's certainly a prediction. They've got that right. And in fact, it's the most detailed of all the predictions that we have in the Gospel of Luke. For not only does Jesus reveal where he is going to suffer in Jerusalem, but why he is going to suffer to fulfill, as he says, everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man. And more than that, he tells us how he is going to suffer. Right? He'll be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Now, as you will have noticed, when Jesus says here, everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man, he doesn't specify which verses he has in mind, which texts he's thinking of. And no doubt, he could give us a long list, and arguably he does that in other ways elsewhere. But the word everything is pretty big, isn't it? Everything written about the Son of Man by the prophets. Now, of course, we can, from Luke's gospel, answer the question, what is in his mind, at least to some extent, you know, the way that Jesus speaks about himself, of course, referring to himself as the Son of Man, and the way in which uh, other Old Testament texts are brought into the well, the, not only the teaching of Jesus, but Luke's presentation of his ministry, I think gives us a fairly clear idea that uppermost in his mind is Daniel's prophecy of the Son of Man and Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering servant. Uh, they're big tickets, but there'll be other texts as well, because, of course, Jesus' fulfillment of the Old Testament is not simply the fulfillment of particular verses or individual passages it's the fulfillment of all of the redemptive themes of the Old Testament, right? Like the Exodus, for example, and all of the patterns and the types and the institutions of the Old Testament, like, you know, the temple, like the sacrifices, like indeed the kingship. It's why when we get to the end of Luke's gospel, we read a wonderful statement, chapter 24, verse 44, you'll see it on the screen, when Jesus says, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And this, of course, is why Jesus knows what is going to happen to him. Right? He knows his future because he knows the scriptures. He knows his future because he knows the scriptures. And he knows that every promise of God must have its fulfillment. And indeed, because he knows who he is, he knows it must have its fulfillment in him. Now, friends, that tells us something very, very important. And I'm going to state it like this. Any reading of the Old Testament scriptures that fails to deposit us at the feet of Jesus Christ and fails to lead us to faith in Jesus Christ is a misreading of those scriptures. And we have failed you miserably if somehow you get to the end of your college time and we have not helped you to see that and grasp that and understand that. He is the author of all scripture. He is the subject of all scripture. He is the goal of all scripture. It is all about him, speaks of him, leads to him. Now, the other thing, of course, that Jesus doesn't elaborate on here is how he will be handed over to the Gentiles. He just says that he will be, but how will he be? Well, of course, he doesn't need to explain that. He's explained that already. Back in the first prediction, back in chapter 9, verse 22, a look on the screen, you'll see that verse. He says there, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. Right? That is how he will come to be in the hands of the Gentiles. But it's the Jewish leaders 
and the Jewish mob that will hand him over to them. Now, many of us will be aware, and I hope perhaps are more than aware, of the ugly history of anti-Semitism, you know, a, a, a really a, almost, you might call it a kind of a spiritual virus that some have called the devil that never dies. And all of us are no doubt aware of the sort of recent renaissance of anti-Semitism all around the world that's been brewing, in fact, for quite a few years. The last decade has really seen a rise in anti-Semitism globally. Uh, but, of course, it's burst into flame very recently. In fact, it burst into flame on October 8, right? It was the day after the Hamas terrorists invaded Israel, butchered, burned, raped, kidnapped hundreds of Jewish civilians. Okay, so it burst into flame before Israel responded, whatever we might think of that response. But, of course, now that Israel has responded, the problem of anti-Semitism has, well, taken off a plenty. It's reached such heights in the U.S. that the House of Representatives just last week has passed a bill aimed at cracking down on anti-Semitic speech. And, again, whatever we might think of Israel's conduct of the war in Gaza, and that's a separate conversation that we're not going to have today, uh, I, you know, such legislation, I think, is not only appropriate but needed. But here's the thing that's come out in the process. The way that anti-Semitism is defined in at least the U.S. bill is so loose that it could easily be used against Christians for preaching the gospel and for stating the incontrovertible historic fact that it was the Jewish leaders and the Jewish mob that handed Jesus over to the Gentiles to be put to death. So, again, we'll wait and see how that plays out. It's a classic instance of solving one problem and creating another in the process, but that's often how things happen in our world. But, again, that is in God's hands. But when we come back to the text, what we realise, of course, is that Jesus is not here about apportioning blame for his suffering, as if it's all these people's fault or those people's fault. It's all of our fault. We know that. It was my sin that held him there. That's right. But he's not apportioning blame. That's not the point of his prediction. Its focus is on the prophetic necessity of his death and of the victory that lies beyond it. Because, of course, the prophecy, the prediction doesn't end in death. It ends in the greatest word of hope imaginable. On the third day, he will rise again. But that's the future of the Son of Man. Yes, that he will suffer. Yes, that he will die. But yes, that he will rise again, all according to the scriptures. Now, here's the bizarre twist in this passage that, of course, you no doubt felt and saw and comprehended to some degree. The disciples, we're told, did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them and they did not know what he was talking about. And it's important to realize that their incomprehension is not due to what you know, some people call the, the messianic secret, right? That idea which has arisen from the fact that, well, sometimes Jesus told some people not to mention the things he'd done or to tell them others about who he was. And indeed, he'd done this with his disciples back in chapter 9, right? Just before the first prediction of his death, have a look on the screen. You'll see the relevant verses 20 and 21. Just after Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ of God, Jesus strictly charged them or charged and commanded them to tell this to no one. And presumably they didn't. But here's the thing. They knew. Right? They were in on the secret. And so the problem wasn't that they were ignorant, nor was it that this was the first time Jesus had mentioned his suffering and death. It clearly wasn't. Nor was there anything opaque about his language. No, his words are as plain as plain can be. The Gentiles will mock me, insult me, spit on me, flog me, and kill me. Is there anything unclear in that? And then, of course, on the third day, I will rise again. Equally clear. But they don't get it. And so what's the problem? Well, the problem is that, that Jesus' words so defy their expectations that they just can't 
make sense of them. They can't make them fit with their pre-understanding. Here's how Daryl Bock puts it in his um, rather gargantuan commentary. It you know, takes a bit of weightlifting just to lug it around, so I can testify to that. But um, Bock puts it this way. He says, the disciples could not understand how his death could fit into the divine plan for Jesus. Just could not compute it. And so what's the problem? The problem is they're blind. They're blind. Spiritually blind. Blind to what is written in the prophets. Blind to what it will take for Jesus to provide full and free forgiveness of sins once and for all for the salvation of those who believe. They can't see it. And note the stress on who's responsible. It's very clear in verse 34, the disciples did not understand any of this. They did not know what he is talking about. It's their fault. The blockage was at their end. No one else to blame. But of course, the only way they will ever see and ever understand is if Jesus himself graciously, mercifully, miraculously opens their eyes, opens their minds to understand the scriptures, which of course he will indeed later do. But it was not his purpose to do that for them just yet. And that's why Luke drops another element right into the middle of verse 34. You would have seen it. when he says, its meaning was hidden from them. Now, very similar statements made back in chapter 9. So again, have a look at the screen. We're in chapter 9. We're told that they did not understand this saying and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Okay, so the disciples are true to form. And their problem is there in a nutshell. They're blind. They can't cure themselves and they won't even ask for help. They won't ask for help from the one who can do for them what they cannot do for themselves. Now, here's a question. Can you imagine being like that? I hope you can. I suspect you can. Because we're all like that. That's our natural fallen state, to be like that. It's only by the grace of God and his miraculous mercy that we are anything other than that. Because, of course, thankfully, Jesus is intent to change us. He doesn't want to leave us like that any more than he left the disciples like that. He provides a way out of the darkness. And here's where we come to the second part of the passage because, well, wonderfully in the way that Luke has presented things to us, he has given us here an incident that shows us that way, that way out of the darkness. Let's have a look at, secondly, the mercy of the Son of David. Okay, we've seen the future of the Son of Man, now the mercy of the Son of David. We told in verse 35 that as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening, and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Okay, so... Again, picture the scene as Scripture intends us to, right? It doesn't give us visuals. It gives us words that we might supply the visuals. Picture it, a man there who can see nothing, utterly destitute, begging for crumbs, begging for change, totally dependent on the mercy of others for his daily survival. Talk about the effects of visual impairment, right? There they are, writ large. But these are the almost inevitable consequences of being blind in, well, at least in the ancient world and, of course, many parts of our present world. There he is, begging. But while his eyes don't don't work, his ears do. His ears do, and, of course, that's, well, quite common, of course, for those of us who have suffered impairment in one part of our body. Other parts come to the rescue to some extent. My, My friend who I worked with was like that. He was a very fine musician, had the most wonderful hearing, could hear things that certainly most mortals can't. Uh, And, uh, well, praise God for that. But this man, I guess, had some similar capacity. He hears something. In fact, he hears the movement of people. He hears the approach of a crowd. But, of course, he doesn't know exactly what's going on or who's coming. 
And so thankfully someone tells him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Now, evidently he knew something about Jesus. In fact, he clearly knows quite a lot. He knows what Jesus can do, as we'll see. And he's even come to understand who Jesus is, that he is the Messiah, right? the Christ, the promised king of Israel, great David's greatest son. He's got that. That's why he calls out in verse 38 there, Jesus, son of David, right? have mercy on me. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? The, the crowd's not impressed by this. You know, perhaps he's ruining their kind of their selfie moment with Jesus or something. I don't know. Uh, he's making a scene at least, and they're not impressed. Let's shut this guy up. Verse 39, those led, who led the way rebuked him told him to be quiet, but he would do no such thing. This was way too important. In fact, it was so important that he decided to take it up a couple of notches, right? right? He shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And suddenly the soundscape changes, the moving crowds ceased. What's happening now? Well, verse 40 tells us Jesus stopped. And not only did he stop, but he spoke. And he ordered the man to be brought to him. Now again, just picture it in your mind's eye. Jesus clearly heard his shouting. Jesus heard his confession. Jesus heard his plea for mercy. Jesus was interested in this man, interested in what he wanted from him. And that's why we're told that when he came near, Jesus asked him the all too obvious question. What do you want me to do for you? Now, of course, we know his reply, but before we come to ponder it again, I just want to pause for a moment and ask myself the question, but also ask you the question. How would I answer if Jesus asked that question of me? What do you want me to do for you? What is it that you most want? What is it that you most need? What is it that you desire above and beyond anything else? What do you want Jesus to do for you? It's a very important question. It's important that we answer it. And I think we need to ponder it. Ponder it hard. Ponder it prayerfully. Because it will make all the difference to your future, my future. For Jesus is generally, genuinely interested in you, in me. He's genuinely interested in our answer to that question. And he's not lacking in power to give us what we really need, what we most need, what we truly desire. Let's just hold that question now and leave it to come back to in a moment. Let's come back to our blind brother and look at his answer, which of course doesn't surprise us. Now you might think, isn't his need for spiritual sight even greater than his need for physical sight? Of course it is. But by God's grace, he already has that. (laughs) He already sees who Jesus is. He already knows what he can do for him. That's why he says to him, Lord, I want to see. And of course he did. Of course he did. And what's Jesus' answer? Of course you can. Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. 
We're not given insight into this man's uh, mind, but I can well imagine him saying, what? My faith? (laughs) My faith did this? My faith healed me? My faith has such power? Well, of course, in one sense, no. It's Jesus' power that's healed him. It's Jesus' mercy that has done this. But, of course, in another sense, yes, because it is by faith in Jesus' power. It is by trusting in Jesus' mercy that he has received what he has asked for, the recovery of his sight, and receive it he did. Look at the text. Immediately. No wait time. It's not coming in the post. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. And when all the people saw it, they praised God too. Now, I hope we're familiar with the thoroughly biblical formula. You'll see it on the screen there. Salvation is by grace, through faith, in Christ. It's thoroughly biblical. But it's incomplete. Because there's another element Scripture adds. Salvation is by grace, through faith, in Christ, for praise. For the glory of God. For the magnification of the name of Jesus. That is the end point of all the mighty acts of God, the saving works of his Son. He praised God, and when all the people saw it, they also praised God. Well, there's a whole sermon to be preached on that verse, but you'll be glad to know I'm not going to preach it now. I'll leave that for another day, but let me finish this sermon this way with the help of Miss Nabagoo, who saw that coming. He didn't. Mr. Magoo, if you don't know Mr. Magoo, he was a comical character, certainly of my youth, but uh, perhaps some of our youth as well, a cartoon character who refused to acknowledge that he couldn't see properly, he refused to wear glasses and, well, would drive around and do various other things, kind of smiling and singing and enjoying himself and enjoying his travels, oblivious to the bedlam and the chaos uh, that he was creating all around him. That's Mr. Magoo. And so there's a syndrome that people call by his name, Mr. Magoo Syndrome. And, well, I hope you are familiar with it because guess what? You have it. (laughs) I have it. By nature, we are all Mr. Magoo. We don't see. And we cause incalculable damage because of our blindness, both to ourselves and to others. But, of course, there is one who can cure it. And our business is to learn from our blind brother to cry out to the son of David, to ask him to do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves, to give us the eyes that we lack. Lord, I want to see. And friends, I want to encourage you to make that a daily prayer because, frankly, we need to see all kinds of things. Now, you may know what you need to see, but you also may need to ask the Lord to help you see that which you need to see. Because perhaps you need to see your sin more clearly than you do. Or perhaps you need to see his grace more clearly than you do. Perhaps you need understanding understanding of his word, understanding of your circumstances. Perhaps you need his guidance, his help, his healing. Whatever it is, ask him. He's interested in you. What do you want me to do for you? For the Son of Man who suffered for our sins and rose from the dead for our salvation, he is asking that question of us, just as he asked it of our blind friend. What do you want me to do for you? So 
Father, let's be ready with an answer as we put our faith in him.